Um, today we're talking about um, the fictional world as opposed to the real world. In God's world, where nature and God are the creator of all things, right? Those things that are created are what we call natural. I mean, they wouldn't come into existence without God or nature's influence and ability to create. I mean, I didn't create myself. My mother and father may have participated in creation of me, but I don't think they could have created me. And um, we know this because every time man delves into trying to become God and create things, he usually has catastrophic uh, effects. So, you know, man never makes creations that are as beautiful and wonderful as God's creations. We have um, the real world and we have the fictional world. And in order to have a society where um, one man gets to take another man's uh, labor, uh, the attorneys have created attorney world, or what I like to call attorney world, which is really the world of fictions. What are fictions? Fictions are things that don't really exist, you know. Casper the ghost is a fiction. Casper the ghost can appear, but fictions, while fictions can appear, it's something that is almost magical because in reality, the Bank of America is a fictional entity. We know it's a fictional entity when we think about it because one can never actually meet the Bank of America. You can meet a worm, you can meet a bird, you can... Uh, interact with things that are real, but you cannot interact with things that are fictional. Corporation, an artificial person or legal entity created by or under the authority of the laws of the state or a nation. So who gives the corporation authority to act? Its master, the government, right? And it's an artificial person. What's a person? A mask, an act, somebody playing a part. So it's a fictitious actor. Okay, here we are with the 1828 Noah Webster's Dictionary and the definition of person. Person, persona, said to be compounded of per, through, or by, and sonus sound, a Latin word signifying primarily a mask user, used by actors on the state. One. One. And the individual human being consisting of body and soul. That's the average common usage. Two, a man, woman, or child considered as opposed to things or distinct from them. In other words, not a corporation or a piece of wood. Five, a human being represented in dialogue, fiction, or on the state. Character, a player appears in the person of King Lear. Character of office, number six. How different is the same man from himself as he sustains the person of a magistrate and that of a friend? So he takes on a robe and he calls himself a magistrate and he's a persona. He's an actor. See? Well, let's go down to eight. In law, an artificial person is a corporation or body politic. So by what right does a fictional thing have any right to exist and put Im impose itself on something that's real? See? It's a very interesting thought when you start thinking about it. Can a fictional thing like Bank of America that you cannot meet, can the Bank of America impose its will on a man or woman? No, it can't. That would be impossible. And in truth, Bank of America never imposes its will on a man or a woman. Only agents of the Bank of America, who are men and women, impose their will, not the Bank of America's will. They really impose their will on a man or a woman. So when uh, the policeman says that uh, the city of Santa Rosa has a law against, uh, you know, um, jaywalking, I'm sorry, the city of Santa Rosa is a fictional entity. Can it impose its will on a man or a woman? No. 
So who are we really speaking of when we're speaking of the city of Santa Rosa has a law? We're only speaking of a group of men and women who have usurped authority that they do not possess, right? Because the minute you start challenging them on their ability to have the authority to impose their will on you, they will immediately revert to, well, I'm not imposing my will on you. I was elected by the voters and I'm doing what's in their best interest. Because people with lighters can light fires and fires can burn houses down and therefore in the best interests of society as a whole for the safety and welfare of society we we have banned lighters and so when 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 i ask uh, you know the dog catcher if he has the right to take my private property my dog he says oh yes you know the county has uh, passed a law and i go well let me meet the county then because i want to talk to them about it oh well you know you can go down to the county supervisors meeting no you said the county imposed the law right so it immediately falls apart for them as to as to verifying where their authority comes from and in reality the authority comes from a gun there is no law there is no justification there is no authority the authority always comes from a gun. It's always a physical force that makes you comply with somebody else's will and the party that's forcing you to comply with their will can never lawfully justify it. Or it certainly can't justify it under the Bible. The Bible is the Word of God according to Congress. They passed a uh, statement stating that the Bible was the Word of God. This is Public Law 97-280, 96 Statute 12-11 from the 97th Congress, Joint Resolution, authorizing and requesting the President to proclaim 1983 as the Year of the Bible. Whereas the Bible, the Word of God, has made a unique contribution in shaping the United States as a distinctive and blessed nation and people. Whereas deeply held religious convictions springing from the Holy Bible, from the Holy Scriptures, led to the early settlement of our nation. As in the words of President Andrew Jackson, that the Bible is, quote, the rock on which our republic rests. Okay? And this was approved October 4th, 1982. Well, Sander Spooner wrote an excellent article on the Constitution of No Authority. And if you read it, you'll see that um, he, he, his proposition is that everything in life is contracts. All men are by nature free. And as we see, this is true. The Hawaiian Constitution says that, you know, all men are by nature free. Okay, here is the Constitution of the State of California as amended and enforced November 4th, 2008. Like they have really have a right to amend the Constitution without a vote of the people. Think about that. Preamble, we the people of the state of California. Uh, why does it say we the citizens of the state of California or we the citizens of the United States? Because only citizens of the United States were allowed to vote on, the consti on this Constitution that was created in 1879 and never accepted by Congress. Grateful to Almighty God for our freedom. To who? Who do we get the freedom from? Almighty God. In order to secure and perpetuate its blessings, do establish this Constitution. So who owns and, and controls this Constitution and this document? The people do. Do the citizens? Nope. Article 1, Declaration of Rights. Inalienable Rights, Section 1. All people, not citizens, are by nature free and independent and have inalienable rights rights can't be taken away you can't be charged fee can't be charged money for the exercise of your rights among these are enjoying and defending the life and liberty acquiring possessing and protecting property and pursuing and obtaining safety happiness and privacy Oops, that means you can't spy on my emails or on my cell phone conversation because it is a right. I have a right to privacy. 
So anybody who's going to take my rights away from me without lawful authority, I mean, all the people that work in government did take an oath of office, not did, they're required to take an oath of office to the Constitution. And this is it, the Declaration of Independence. All men are created equal. And they all have rights, and among the rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And you can find court cases that say the pursuit of happiness really meant the pursuit and acquiring and possessing of property. Okay, this is a Supreme Court case. Men are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. I mean, Declaration of Independence, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Right. So he says, quote, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and to secure, not grant or create. In other words, the government doesn't grant those rights or create those rights. It secured those rights. To grant or create these rights, governments are instituted. That property, which a man has honestly acquired, he retains full control of, subject to these limitations. First, that he shall not use it to his neighbor's injury, and that does not mean that he must use it for his neighbor's benefit. Property is devoted to a public use when and only when the use of is one which the public in its organized capacity to wit the state has a right to create and maintain, and therefore one which all the public have a right to demand and share in. Quote, take, for instance, the only store in a little village. All the public and the village are interested in it, interested in the quantity and quality of the goods on its shelves and their prices and in time at which it opens and closes and generally in the way in which it is managed. In short, interested in the use. Does it follow that the village public have a right to control these matters? I cannot bring myself to, to believe that when the owner of property has by his industry, skill, and money made a certain piece of his property of large value to many, he has thereby deprived himself of the full dominion over it, which he had when it was of comparatively little value. Nor can I believe that the control of the public over one's property or business is at all dependent upon the extent to which the public is benefited by it. The paternal theory of government is to me odious. The utmost possible liberty to the individual and the fullest possible protection to him and his property is both the limitation and the duty of government. So there you go. Mr. Budd versus New York 143 U.S. 517 in 1892. You have a right to private property. You have a right to control your property. So, uh, excuse me, but if, if my car is my property, you can't force me to keep a VIN number in the windshield. And if I cut it out, I can do whatever I want to my property. The fact that you could pass a law that says I can't remove it is a complete violation of my rights if it's my property. So here we have another court case. This is from the Colorado Supreme Court in 1961. Article 2, Section 3 of the Constitution provides that all persons have certain natural, essential, and inalienable rights, among which may be reckoned the right of acquiring, possessing, and protecting property. A motor vehicle is property, and a person cannot be deprived of property without due process of law. What's that? That's a court case. The term property within the meaning of the due process clause includes the right to make full use of the property which one has an unalienable right to acquire. People versus Nothouse, 363 P. Second 180. Okay, here's this out of Black's Law, fourth. Due process of law, as used in the Constitution, cannot mean less than a prosecution or suit instituted and conducted according to the prescribed forms and solemnities for ascertaining guilt or determining the title to property. Due process of law is a court case. Due process of law in its regular course of administration through courts of justice. Due process of law from Black's Law, Fourth Dictionary. Law 
in its regular course of administration through courts of justice. Because under common law, you can only control what you own. If I own property, I can put no trespassing signs up and I can bar anybody from stepping on my property. And if they do step on my property against my will, I can demand that they leave. And if they don't leave, I can shoot them. That's pretty serious. It is true that you can demand that nobody trespass on your property and you are within your right to do so. What's your uh, biggest form of property that you own and control? Your body. Your body is your property. It's your private property. And if you say you can't trespass on my private property, trespass is physically violating my property. You hit me, that's a physical violation of my property. So let's go into uh, the bifurcation of uh, reality from fiction, where Instead of living under God's law and common law, which is the law that's known to all, what's a common law known to all? Hey, thou shalt not steal. If you go out and ask people in the street if they know that there's a law against stealing and that the Bible states that thou shalt not steal, do they agree with that, that they follow that law and that they know that law, you're going to find what, 100% compliance? Almost everybody knows the uh, commandment that says thou shall not steal. You won't find very many people that say, never heard of that. Even thieves know that thou shall not steal is a law. Now let's move into man's law. If I take out the penal code and I say, what law in the penal code says you can't steal? How many people out of a hundred you think could re recite which penal code um, says that it's against the law to steal? How many? I'll bet you not one. Even the police don't know what laws there are on the books and can't cite them in their entirety. So we have a rule, an, a maxim of law actually. A maxim is something that's true all the time, like water doesn't run uphill. That's a maxim, right? Water does not run uphill. It's a physical impossibility. So it becomes true all the time. So a maximum of law is that any law that, ca that isn't known to the common people, it, it isn't a common known usage, is void for vagueness. That the terms of a penal statute creating a new offense must be sufficiently explicit to inform those who are subject to it, what conduct on their part will render them liable to its penalties is a well-recognized requirement, consonant alike with ordinary notions of fair play and the settled rules of law and a statute which either forbids or requires the doing of an act in terms so vague that men of common intelligence must necessarily guess at its meaning and differ as to its application violates the first essential of due process of law. And that's from Collins versus Kentucky, 234 U.S. 634. So that's a Supreme Court case. And that's in uh, complete, um, you know, conflict with ignorance of the law is no excuse. So, you know, to be fair to society, society should know what laws and what actions are uh, going to get them in trouble and what laws and what actions are not going to get them in trouble. So you take a look at the vehicle code and it's what 3,000 pages of fine print. How many people know everything that the vehicle code says? How many people know half of what the vehicle code says? So let's see, can anybody really understand the 2008 vehicle code of California? I mean, let's just take a look here. How many pages would you have to know? You know, this is ridiculous. And every, any single one of these pages has enough fine print on it to make it impossible to know it all. How many people could quote three codes in the vehicle code? Complete, right? Everybody can quote, thou shall not kill. But how many people can quote 
any vehicle code uh, violations in its entirety? My guess is nobody. So even the police don't quote vehicle codes in their entirety. What they do is they write you up for a code violation of you violated code 22307. Well, I don't know what that means. Um, can you read it to me? No, I don't. Ig ignorance of the law is no excuse. It's not my job to explain the law to you. Actually, it is your job to explain the law to me. And if you don't know what it is, you're incompetent to make a determination. I mean, how do you determine if the law was violated if you don't know the law? And then let's talk about all the terms that are used in the law. Because in fictional world, in attorney world, they make terms up that sound like words in English that everybody is familiar with, but in truth are not words in English that everybody is familiar with. So my point in explaining all this is that if you operate in the world today, you are going to be faced with living in a, a, a dichotomy of two different forms of the world. One form is the real world, where God is the uh, and nature run it, right? And the laws of nature apply. And the other world is the fictional world. So let's look at fictional world for a minute. Fictional world is run entirely by attorneys, the law society. They create a privately run society that only they are members of, that only they can sue in, that only they can represent other parties in, that only they have control over as all judges who make determinations are members of the Bar Society. Joe McCarthy. I had a government professor and his name was Robert Cushman. I was his research assistant, and he wanted me to see that our country was straying from its most basic values by some of our politicians who were seeing communists in every closet, but that there were lawyers who were defending the rights of these people to think, to speak, to write freely. And his point was, that if you are a lawyer, you are able to make things a little better for your skill. And that idea that you have a license to practice law, you can make a living, but you're not going to really be satisfied if you're like a skilled artisan, like a plumber. You do a day's work and you get a day's pay. but you have a skill that enables you to make life a little better for someone else, for your community. And my tremendous satisfaction is that I was able to use my skill as a lawyer to make things a little better for other people. And so I hope that the law students here will use the their license to practice law in that way, to give back to their communities and to make life a little better because you have been there. They have an oath to honor the court's wishes above their oath to honor the people's wishes. So if you have an oath to honor the court and the court is a corporation out for profit, and its profit comes from the people, I'd say that there's a huge conflict of interest and you can never get any justice if justice is the determination of what is true. Because in attorney world, deceit, lies, and, and falsehoods are honored. If you don't believe me, let's look a little closer at attorney world. In the real world, in God's world, you have a situation where if the, the, in common law, a contract is defined by having three elements minimum. One, a meeting of the minds or full disclosure. If, you, if two parties don't realize they're bargaining for the same thing, they don't understand what they're bargaining for and, 
and they have differences of opinion about what they're bargaining for, the bargain is void. It's too vague. Number two, if there's no valuable consideration exchanged, it's void. Why? Because nobody's going to give away grandma's farm for a bowl of cereal. That's not uh, legitimate. That's not a legitimate contract. That's a deception. Something about it is, you know, the party giving away the farm for a bowl of cereal is not, is not right in the head, right? So you're going to avoid that contract. And number three, there has to be evidence of offer and acceptance. You have to have two parties that sit down at the table and both sign the agreement saying that they have mutual obligations to each other and that they understand what those are. If only one party signs, there's no mutuality of obligation, is there? Who do I hold responsible for the other side? Oh, Bank of America Corporation. Can I meet the Bank of America Corporation? If I can't meet them, if I can't cross-examine Bank of America Corporation, then they don't exist and they can't be a party to a contract. Okay, this is Black's Law contract, right? An agreement between two or more parties. Where do they have to be living? Preliminary step in making of which is offer by one and acceptance by the other. Well, I guess dead people can't accept contracts. In which minds of the parties meet and concur in understanding of terms. Lee versus Travelers Insurance Company. And then it is agreement between creating obligation. So each party has to be obligated, right? In which there must be competent parties, subject matter, legal consideration, that's m the money or something of value, mutuality of agreement and mutuality of obligation. An agreement must be not so vague or uncertain that terms are not ascertainable. So in other words, there has to be a meeting of the minds. You have to know what you're bargaining for. And those are the legal definitions of a contract, not the lawful definitions, the legal definition. Only living people can make contracts. This is God's law. What do we have in fictional world, in attorney world, in the world and deception? We have a situation where a person that doesn't exist in reality, all persons are fictions, right? We have a person that exists fictionally getting into, into a contract with a, with a man or woman that exists in reality. That is an impossibility. A man cannot get into a contract with a corporation. Corporations can't sign contracts, can't see contracts, can't contemplate contracts. Therefore, corporations legitimately in common law, in God's law, cannot enter into a contract. Only agents of corporations can enter into contracts. And agents can't act on their own. They can only act on behalf of the corporation. Therefore, how can there be a lawful contract when are you going to hold the agent liable? And then here's the UCC 3-402 signature by representative. If a party acting or purporting to act as a representative signs an instrument, by signing either in the name of the represented person or the name of the signer, the represented person is bound by the signature. Who's the represented person? Whatever person's name is on the document, right? So Bank of America, if their name is on the document, if they're the undersigned, if Bank of America is below the signature, then the party above the signature is signing on behalf of Bank of America. Okay, so under um, one, if the form of the signature shows unambiguously, that's extremely clearly, right, that the signature is made on behalf of the represented person who is identified on the instrument, and I put in brackets there, i.e. John Henry Doe in all capital letters, right? And what would unambiguously be? If I sign it as, you know, my signature as agent or as authorized representative, then I'm clearly stating that I'm the authorized representative. Then the representative is not liable on the instrument. So that's really important. And then we go down to see if whatever state you're in, there's a um, 
commercial code that mirrors the UCC and the numbers will be very similar. So while the UCC is a national code and UCC 3-402 in California it's the commercial code 3402 but it says the same thing if a person acting or purporting to act as a representative signs an instrument by signing either the name of the represented person or the name of the signer and you go down to one there the form of the signature shows unambiguously that the signature is made on behalf of the represented person we know persons are fictional entities who is identified in the instrument the representative is not liable on the instrument now of course they're going to pretty much ignore you on that one but the point is is that if you sign as the authorized representative you are not liable the party who's you're signing on behalf of is liable let's see them put the fictional entity John Henry Doe in jail he's gonna say hey I don't have any liability under UCC section 3-402 the agent has no liability so once again contracts void any contract between a corporation and a living man is void so what did the attorney world do they created fictional entities for people that people could stand in place of that people can be the authorized signature for that people can be agents of what are the fictional entities the straw man all capital letter name is a fictional person right a fictional person that they then expect the living man or woman to step in and be the agent for and act so in fictional world court can only see fictions court is not designed to see men and women court doesn't isn't designed to have one man sue another man court is designed for one fiction to sue another fiction so in fictional world uh, the policeman can come to your door and he's not a policeman he's an agent for a corporation when he signs his name he signs as a straw man if you see him do an affidavit you know of a complaint verified sworn complaint against you he will never sign that as himself he will always sign as the undersigned what's under his signature there's a line and then underneath that signature line the undersigned is the party who's responsible and that name will always be in all capital letters or at least if they understand the system it will be because otherwise they're responsible if you get somebody who signs and the undersigned is in the upper and lower case and represents a man or woman then the man or woman is liable so they will almost always sign the undersigned will be a corporation and if it's not the district attorney's office which obviously is a corporation because there's no can I once again the rule is can I meet the district attorney's office if I can't meet it then it's a fictional entity it doesn't exist in reality so we have the fictional world where a policeman come to the door and say let me in I have a warrant for your arrest and you say let me see it let me see the judge signed warrant that you have in your possession he goes you have to let me in I told you I have a warrant for my arrest I don't believe you show it to me I don't have to show it to you I'm breaking the door down you're refusing to come lawfully you're refusing my lawful order <laughs> so once again I'm sorry I don't understand what is your lawful order how can you have a lawful order if you don't sign have a judge signed a warrant you're violating the Constitution you took an oath to what's your oath your oath is a promise to do something it's really a resolution that you promise to do something and it's not really a binding contract until I accept it but once I accept your oath of office it becomes a binding contract and under the Constitution and the Fourth Amendment you can't seize me without a warrant so I'm sorry where's your warrant I don't have to have it now in attorney fictional world they don't have a warrant for you who do they have a warrant for you have to go watch the episode that I did called straw man redemption and you'll get a much clearer idea of this fictional world if there's a warrant it's not for you in your upper and lowercase name it's not for a man or woman 
it's for the defendant whose name is in all capital letters John Henry Doe. Well, that's not me. Well, we're taking you anyway. <laughs> you see? Do you have any proof that it's me? Nope. Well, we're taking you anyway. See? This is the point. It's the, the law comes from the gun. It does not come from law. And if you argue law with them, they will revert to the gun and they will refuse to answer questions. Okay, this is a good article that I like called Why the Gun is Civilization by Marco Kluse. Human beings have only two ways to deal with one another, reasoned and force. If you want me to do something for you, you have, to, you have a choice of either convincing me via argument or compelling me to do your bidding under threat of force. Every human interaction falls into one of those two categories without exception reason or force. That's it. In a truly moral and civilized society, people exclusively interact through persuasion. Force has no valid place or a, method, or a valid method or a social interaction. And the only thing that removes force from the menu is the personal firearm, as paradoxical as it may sound to some. When I carry a gun, you cannot deal me with me by force. You have to use reason and try to persuade me because I have a way to neg negate your threat of employment of force. The gun is the only personal weapon that puts a 100-pound woman on equal footing with a 220-pound mugger, a 75-year-old retiree on equal footing with a 19-year-old gangbanger, and a single gay guy on equal footing with a carload of drunken guys with baseball bats. The gun removes the disparity in physical strength, size, or numbers between a potential attacker and a defender. There are plenty of people who consider the gun as the source of bad force equations. These are the people who think that we'd be more civilized if all guns were removed from society. Because a firearm makes it easier for an armed mugger to do his job, that of course is only true if the mugger's potential victims are mostly disarmed, either by choice or by legislative fiat. It has no validity when most of a mugger's potential marks are armed. People who argue for the banning of arms ask for automatic rule by the young, the strong, and the many. And that's the exact opposite of a civilized society. A mugger, even an armed one, can only make a successful living in a society where the state has granted him a force monopoly. Then there's the argument that the gun makes confrontations lethal that otherwise would only result in injury. This argument is fallacious in several ways. Without guns involved, confrontations are won by the physically superior party inflicting overwhelming injury on the loser. People who think fists, bats, sticks, or stones don't constitute lethal force watch too much TV, where people take beatings and come out of it with a bloody lip, at worst. The fact that the gun makes lethal force easier works solely in favor of the weaker defender, not the stronger attacker. If both are armed, the field is level. The gun is the only weapon that's as lethal in the hands of an octogenarian as it is in the hands of a weightlifter. It simply wouldn't work as well as a force equalizer if it weren't both lethal and easily employable. When I carry a gun, I don't do so because I'm looking for a fight, but because I'm looking to be left alone. The gun at my side means that I cannot be forced, only persuaded. I don't carry it because I'm afraid, but because it enables me to be unafraid. It doesn't limit the actions of those who inter interact with me through reason, only the actions of those who would do so by force. It removes force from the equation, and that's why carrying a gun is a civilized act. What do you call somebody who refuses to answer questions? Okay, silence equals fraud. Silence can only be equated with fraud where there is a legal or moral duty to speak, or where an inquiry left unanswered would be intentionally misleading. We cannot condone this shocking conduct by the IRS. Wow, what a shock. 
Our revenue system is based upon the good faith of the taxpayers, and the taxpayers should be able to expect the same from government in its enforcement and collection activities. This sort of deception, right, which is, what are they talking about? Silence is deception, right? Will not be tolerated, and if this is the routine, it should be corrected immediately. And this is from U.S. versus Tweel, 550F second, and it's quoting U.S. versus Pruden, 424F second, in 1970. Fraud. There is no question of the general doctrine that fraud vitiates the most solemn contracts, documents, and even judgments. There is also no question that many rights originally founded in fraud become, by lapse of time, by the difficulty of proving the fraud, and by the protection which the law throws around rights once established by formal judicial proceedings and tribunals established by law, according to the methods of the law, no longer open to inquiry in the usual and ordinary methods. In other words, they're going to protect themselves once they've made a determination, a legal determination in a court and you wait too long, five, you know, five years maybe, they're not going to revisit it and, and reverse it, even if you can prove that fraud was involved. Of this class of are judgments and decrees of a court deciding between parties before the court and subject to its jurisdiction in a trial which has presented the claims of the parties and where they have received the consideration of the court. United States versus Throckmorton, 98 U.S. 61 in 1878, and that's a Supreme Court case. And in this case, government officials are fiduciaries. Quote, fraud in its elementary common law sense of deceit. And this is one of the meanings that fraud bears in the statute C. United States v. Dial. It includes the deliberate concealment of material information in a setting of fiduciary obligation. A public official is a fiduciary toward the public. And the word fiduciary means trustee. And the trustee is, can be held criminal liable if he does not execute the trust according to the terms of the trust. The trustee can go to jail. So a, a trustee is a fiduciary. So the public official is a fiduciary. What trust is he a fiduciary of? The Constitution is a trust, right? The grantor slash beneficiary are the people who created it. And the government officials are the trustees who accept their position of trustees by signing the oath of office to execute it. Including in the case of a judge, the litigants who appear before him, and if he deliberately conceals material information from them, he is guilty of fraud. So, they're saying that if you ask a judge a question and he deliberately conceals the answer to that question and it's, in, and it's uh, relevant, he's guilty of fraud. McNally versus United States, 43 U.S. 350 in 1987. That's the Supreme Court case. So these cases point out that when you ask government officials for answers to questions you have on the legitimacy and authority that they have, and they don't, and they remain silent, that silence is fraud. Fraud is punishable by jail time, as a as they are fiduciaries, and they have no authority. To, to keep silent when it would be intentionally misleading. And of course, if you're not going to answer, it's going to be misleading. What do you call somebody who refuses to show you authority? I'd call them a pirate, right? Because that's what pirates do. That's what outlaws do. Do we, in fact, today live in a state of anarchy, as Howard Griswold points out and makes a case for? Do we live in a state of anarchy? What's anarchy? Anarchy is a state where there is no law. Now, what law do we have? There's only one law that, you know, that really applies to everyone. That's the law of God, right? God's laws as expressed in every religion in the world. Every religion in the world makes the point that it's the law of reciprocity. You treat others as you would have yourself treated. So just to give you an example of how all the religions are the same, Christianity, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye to them, so to them, for this is the law and the prophets, King James Version, Matthew 7, 12. Confucianism, do not do unto others what you would not like 
yourself, then there would be no resentment against you, either in the family or in the state. Analects 12.2. Buddhism, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Vedana Varga 5.1. Hinduism, this is the sum of duty. Do not unto others what you would not have them do unto you. Islam, no one of you is a believer until he desires for his brother that which he desires for himself. Judaism, what is hurtful to you, do not do to your fellow man. This is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. Taoism, regard your neighbor's gain as your gain and your neighbor's loss as your own loss. So the point is, is that you want other people to do well. You want other people to leave you alone. You want freedom. If you're willing to be responsible for yourself, if, you know, when you're a young man or a young woman, when you decide that you can take care of yourself without mommy and daddy anymore, you go out and get a job and you have full responsibility for your actions, then you can have full freedom also. If you can have full responsibility and take care of yourself, then you have full freedom also. So, do we have full responsibility for ourselves? Well, in the attorney world, those that are fully responsible are taken advantage of the most. I mean, if you go out and work two jobs, in attorney world, we're going to come up with a lot of laws that say you have to give us half of what you make because we passed a law. And of course, that law only applies to a fictional entity, your straw man. We're going to make you think that it applies to you. And you're talking about a very, very, very small group, in my belief, that basically run all of the programs. And the majority of people that work in government don't really understand the program that they're in. I mean, they understand the way they do things, and this is the way we do things, and we're not going to answer your questions, but they really don't get it that a very, very, very small group of lawyers have come up with plausible deniability as a way of dealing with people that don't want to become and stay slaves in a society that they created. So in this world of uh, attorney world, then, you know, the minute they step into the arena and you question them, lies and deceit come out, right? We have jurisdiction over you because you live in the city of Santa Rosa. I'm sorry, I don't understand. What is the city of Santa Rosa? Will you please define your terms because I don't understand them. No, we're, we, everybody knows what that is. We're moving on. I'm sorry, I haven't had my question answered. Is the city of Santa Rosa a fictional entity? Well, it's a municipal corporation. Well, isn't a municipal corporation a fictional entity? Yeah. So, I'm a man. I'm not a fictional entity. How do I live in a fictional entity? You see? It becomes an interesting quagmire for them because the minute you start actually questioning them on what their terms are, they will not answer your questions because to answer those questions exposes the fraud. And or they don't know themselves. I don't know that every judge that I've ever seen really understands the law and where it comes from. They understand the procedure of this party appeared before me and I have to get him to waive time and to state that he's the defendant and to uh, voluntarily enter a plea and they understand if they don't get a plea they don't have jurisdiction they understand a few of these things but when you start challenging them they don't know where to go they don't know how to answer those questions and instead of they don't even get that they should not be prosecuting it's not their job to do the arraignment you know it's not their job to make com make uh, complaints known. It's not their job. It's only their job to answer procedural questions that you might have. It's the prosecutor's job to answer what form of law he's prosecuting this case under. 
Is it common law? Is it equity? Is it admiralty? Is it maritime? Or is it some unconstitutional form that doesn't exist in the Constitution? Oh, ding, 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 you got the answer there. I mean, I had a de deputy district attorney tell me, well, we're practicing criminal law. I'm confused. I never seen the word criminal law as a form of law being described in the Constitution. And since the Constitution's the supreme law of the land, and only, f only things that are mentioned in there can be exercised, then what, did you just make up something that doesn't exist and try to give it authority? See, this is the real issue, isn't it? Isn't that the real issue? You're practicing an unconstitutional form of law, statutory pleading, criminal law. I don't care what you call it. If it's not equity or common law, it doesn't have any authority. Uh, because it's not admiralty. Admiralty only occurs at sea. Okay, this is a discussion of admiralty. In the case of the Sarah, a libel was filed against 422 casks of wine alleging a forfeiture by false entry. Shipping, right? It appearing in the course of the trial that the seizure was made on land, it was held that this court could not review the case save upon writ of error. Chief Justice Marshall, delivering the opinion of the court, said, quote, by the act constituting the judicial system of the United States, the district courts are courts both of common law and admiralty jurisdiction. In the trial of all cases of seizure on land, the court sits as a court of common law. In cases of seizure made on waters navigable by vessels of 10 tons burthen and upwards, the court sits as a court of admiralty. Okay? Seizure upon water, the court sits as a court of admiralty. In all cases at common law, the trial must be by jury. And in cases of admiralty and maritime jurisdiction, it has been settled in the cases of the Sally, right? That the trial is to be by the court. In other words, there's no jury, just the judge. The judge makes the determination. You're in a court where the judge makes the determination. It's not a common law court. It's a court of admiralty or it's a court of equity. You can't be uh, functioning under admiralty. Are you uh, functioning under military law? I mean, is that gold French flag that you're flying a military flag? And is this a military court? And if it's a military court, I don't know how to defend myself against your military law. Because military law only applies in times of war. And I don't think that the Congress has declared war. And even if it did, we're within the continental union of the several states. We're not at war. I mean, we're not uh, enemy combatants that you're bringing into a military court. So you have no authority to do that. So m most uh, people in court, most attorneys, they don't really understand what's going on. That's my opinion. I don't know. Maybe it's not true. Maybe they all do understand. But I know this. I never get answers to my questions. And there's a reason for that. The reason for that, if you did answer those questions, you're going to have to substantiate your opinions with some kind of law that backs them up. So if I make the statement that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land, and it actually says that in the Constitution, and it was reaffirmed in Marbury versus Madison by Chief Justice Marshall, what are you going to come up with and say, that's not true? Okay. If that's not true, where, you know, that's your opinion, and your opinion's worth about the same as my opinion is. My opinion's backed up by fact, and your opinion is backed up by what? You see? So how do you argue against that? It becomes very difficult. So when your car gets impounded, is your car your private property? If I make a claim that my car is my private property and I have a bill of sale that says it was unencumbered and there's no liens against it and it was sold to me by somebody who claims that there was no liens against it and it was unencumbered and they owned it free and clear and now I'm claiming that it's my property, my private property and I own it free and clear, you're going to have to show me some factual evidence it's not my property. 
So that's complete violation. And not only does the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution say that, but it also says the same thing in the California Constitution. So you have an oath of office, I accept your oath of office, and yet you're going along and breaching your fiduciary duty in violation of your oath of office, committing a criminal trespass against me, with conspiring with the police and the district attorney's office to deny me my rights. How do you answer that? Well, there is no answer to that, is there? Because you've got them dead to rights, you've got facts, and once you've testified to it in court, the facts and the law are entered into the record. How do you argue against that? They would like, in attorney world, they would like to say, well, procedurally, you didn't make the claim in a timely fashion. You didn't enter the claim into the court record. You didn't testify to it, so there was no testimony in the court for the judge to see. There was no judicial notice of the fact that the Fifth Amendment existed, so we, don't ha we can ignore it. Do you think Jesus would have ignored it? Do you think the Buddha would have ignored it? You won't find any place on earth that's a, a Garden of Eden where everybody is free to do as they will. And, you know, freedom and responsibility go hand in hand. And those people that are responsible and work and take care of themselves are left alone. As long as you don't violate your neighbor's rights and trespass upon his rights, you have the freedom to do as you will. So let's look at a few of the interesting aspects of attorney world where fictional entities can attack you and claim that you're a fictional entity and that the rules of common law and contracts don't apply. So let's start off with they send you a letter. doesn't matter what it is. They're sending a letter saying that you have a liability towards them. Could be a credit card company, could be a foreclosure, could be you violated, you got a traffic ticket, doesn't matter what it is. Somebody sends you a piece of paper saying that you're responsible. In common law, in the real world, you're only responsible and have a liability if it's true. And if it is true, or if you want to contest it, you have a right to contest it. I don't believe your statement is true. You know, I don't have any contract with you. You're a debt collector. I have a contract with uh, Capital One, but I don't have a contract with you. So if I don't have a contract with you, you can't claim a personal injury or loss. You can't take me to court. Well, that doesn't matter. We're going to take you to court anyway because we bought the debt from Capital One. Capital One wrote the debt off. Now they're trying to claim that they get, have the right to write the debt off and sell the same debt to you? <laughs> I'd call that unjust enrichment. But in attorney world, that's okay. In God's world, that would be frowned upon and the party committing the fraud would go to jail. But in attorney world, the parties committing the fraud don't go to jail because they pass laws that give them special immunity. So anyway, you get a letter and in the real world, you can throw that in the garbage if it's got no validity. You don't have any liability for that. But in attorney world, let's look at what they say about that. So the first line of defense would be dealing with um, paperwork that you get and we're going to discuss David Reimer's neutral response letter and the beauty of neutral response. And um, I hope this will be interesting and you'll take note of some of the aspects of the neutral response approach to dealing with um, attacks on you by other parties.